What's going on, Bassmaster fans? Welcome into episode 71 of the Inside Bassmaster Podcast. I'm your host, Ronnie Moore, my co-host, as always, Kyle Jesse, the digital content editor, Bassmaster.com. I don't know why I'm doing this with my hand, but I am. I'm hyped up to be back on the podcast with you, Kyle. After a tough, a unseasonably unexpected tough Lake Chickamauga event, um, but a good event overall, and I say a good event because there's always so many different captivating things, guys who catch them that needed to catch them, fish catches that we'll remember forever and moments and stories that always come out of these events, especially for the winter. And once again, seems like it's like we say it a whole lot. It's been three times in the last year. Kudos to Jason Christie, our champion of the event. And this time it was kind of a a really weird final day, Kyle, and you were out there and we'll get into that more. But Kyle, I'm excited to have you on the podcast again, and we're going to get into recap in Chickamauga and also previewing our next event for the Opens, which is this week at the James River. Yeah, it doesn't. It seems like it's been forever, but it's probably only been what a, a little over a week since we did a podcast. But uh, but yeah, definitely happy to be back. Happy to be back in Alabama. Um, get a little bit of a break here from travel and everything. So I'm looking forward to that and. And yeah, like you said, I mean, the event itself, you know, no matter how the events play out, there's always a storyline to be told. There's always something interesting going on. But that last day, you know, obviously it did get tough. Um, you know, I got to see it on the water firsthand, but, you know, keeping up with Bass Track, it was crazy. You just keep, you know how it is with on the water coverage. You're like, you're always trying to pay attention to make sure there's not something crazy going on that, you know, you need to get over and cover. And it just seemed like it never happened <laughs> throughout the course of the day that that crazy story just never happened. It was almost reminiscent of last year at the Sabine River where Jason Christie, you know, basically had what he needed pretty early on. And then the rest of the day just kind of like developed into very little. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of a bizarre deal, but, the t- you know, the tournament in total, obviously, was super entertaining. Giant fish being, you know, being caught some really big bags and, uh, you know, just on a place that has a lot of history and, um, you know, a ton of potential that we saw unlocked on a few of the days. Yeah, I could almost see a little bit of exha- exhaustion, even though there's been a couple days of breaks and some of these guys haven't fished the entire time. But we just finished four elites, a classic, um, a Southern Open, a college event, and I think uh, and a and a or two Southern Opens and a college event all in a two nine week stretch. Events. Yeah. Oh, well, the college yeah, event was in January, yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My bad, my bad. So from the St. John's River in February, we had the Harris chain. We had just a little bit of time and we had the uh, classic. Then we had some opens and some all this all this drama and stuff. And so Sunday at Chickamauga, it seemed like an exhale. And we were just like, "Whoo, we don't have to have another Elite Series event for a month and a half until the end of May. And we got to talk to Jason Christie. He came by the studio and uh, honestly, he said it best. He said, I'm taking the week off a podcast because everyone has heard plenty from me basically after the win at the classic and then finishing almost dead last at Santee Cooper, basically a week and a half later, what a roller coaster three week stretch for him where he is on the top of the mountain. He has been trying so hard to get to, and then goes to a place he's never been in competition and throws a tactic. We expect people to catch him on a frog catches one fish in the middle of the day on day one. And then that was it for the tournament, you know, bottom of the field. And then he turns around and wins Chickamauga in kind of a different fashion. Started out the week in 26th. And I'll say this before we get into our, all of our guests and different things for this show. Christy, uh, other than Jason Christie's wins, our winner of the event, Harris Chain, St. John's River, and Santee Cooper, those three winners, Buddy Gross, John Cruz, and Drew Cook were all in the top two after day one of the tournament. So we knew that they were going to be in contention. Well, we didn't know, but they ended up being contention the whole week. Obviously, two of those guys led wire to wire. Buddy Gross led two of the four days. Then we go to the classic. Jason Christie was tied for ninth, one of the last guys on camera. We got to see him every single day of competition there. He comes back and wins that after going from tied for ninth, tied for the lead, and then the outright lead. And then this event, 26th place. I mean, if you catch 16 pounds in April, Kyle, nine times out of 10, 16 pounds in April at Chickamauga, 26 would be like a blessing. You're going to be 56, but that's yeah. just how weird this week was. It really was. And, you know, it was it was crazy to see, you know, naturally most Elite Series tournaments you see this, but it was it seemed to be more um, evident in this event. 
is, you know, catching them one day and then not catching them at all the, the next day or vice versa. I mean, it seemed like you could make a big jump or you could fall uh, a lot. You know, the amount of guys and the, the I don't want to say any names, but they were all on my fantasy team that did really well after day one and then faltered on day two. And you know, some of those guys went from, you know, top 10 to not even making the cut. I mean, a handful of guys were in that, you know, ballpark, which was crazy to see. But yeah, I mean, it was it was very volatile and you could, you know, you could fall out or jump back in it just as quickly as you, uh, you know, you started. So it was, it was a very interesting event from that standpoint. It did kind of get status quo though. We, we really expected with the lead up of weather for that week. And then we talked about on the podcast, man, the cold and the wind and the forecast for day two, three, and, and we thought maybe day four was not conducive for sight fishing and it ended up going away. Day one was the sight fishing day. People obviously caught fish off bed the other days, but the 10-5 from Patch Lapper, not a bed fish, just caught that one fishing uh, on a jig. That was very cool. But yeah, the weather changing, it kind of lined up for Christy to do his thing. We got to see above the takeoff, the north, you know, up the river at Chickamauga on the Tennessee River, obviously. We got to see down towards the dam, some notorious places that had some notorious community holes, you normally roll up around the corner and you're going to see four or five boats. I'll get a gallery because I got four or five different guys. And you got one dude, you know, one dude on this community hole, one dude on that community hole because they just weren't anywhere specific this week. If you missed the Chickamauga event, lake was three feet low from summer pool, but it was three feet high from winter pool right around April 15th, which is just later this week is when they start normally rising that lake and filling it up and they spend a month doing so. I don't know if they're going to do it the same pace they normally do because it'll only take half a month to fill up being three feet high from winter pool already, Kyle. But um, water levels ended up staying pretty normal and stable. It rose a couple inches each day just based on how much they let out and how much was coming in. So the water level was good, but the dirty water that was dirty early in the event, not conducive for sight fishing, cleaned up. And that was in Christie's area specifically. And then the clean water where the sight fishing happened, it got cold and a lot of pressure and a lot of boats. And then all of a sudden that thing was done. So a lot of different things happened. But at the end of the week, probably if you had to pick what's going to be the lowest winning weight out of the first four events of the season, Santee, uh, Cooper, Chickamauga, Harris Chain, St. John's River, those four events, ain't no way we're picking Chickamauga for the lowest because the bar has been so high there. But 73 and change for Jason Christie. 75 and change was what John Cruz took at the St. John. So Chickamauga, we definitely saw a different one than we've ever been there before. Yeah, I know. Like you said, it was, it was definitely surprising to see the weights as low as they were, but you know, seeing it from on the water, it, it's not hard to believe because like you said, some of those guys that were catching them really good on day one in the clear water area, you know, Chester frost, you know, up to uh, two, two or three miles up that way. Sail those Creek, places Soddy were, Creek. They, yeah. Yes. They, they were very, very crowded. Um, I only got to spend one day of the tournament in that year, uh, but it was absolutely definitely crowded. I mean, that first day, the amount of boats you were rolling in, you know, you'd sit there and look at Bass Track, who's doing well, and you'd just be sitting in one creek, and then the guy that's in first would roll in, the guy that's in second would roll in, the guy that's in third would roll in. So I think those fish, like you said, kind of, kind of either, you know, I don't know if they went away or if they just got really hard to catch or they just caught them all. I mean, there's no telling what the case was, but you know, I, I think making that last for four days was was really very difficult. So um, you saw some of the guys that may have been doing, you know, patterns and fishing area of the lakes or areas of the lake that you might not think be conducive to catching the giant bags, you know, but more consistent, you know, actually play out more. Um, and, you know, before the event, it, you wouldn't have thought that had been the case. You think the guys that were really going to go for it would have would have had the luck. But um, like you mentioned, uh, we talked about it before the tournament about the cold weather. I can tell you firsthand it was frigid out there. I, I, I maybe there's some East Tennessee listeners out here listening. That's a different kind of cold. I mean, it was it was in the 40s. You know, obviously every, those the the last three mornings it was in the 30s. I mean that that in itself super cold. But it would be in the 50s and windy. And I swear I've been warmer in 15 degree weather than I was in 50 yeah. degree on Ch or Chickamauga. So yeah. It was yeah. frigid. And then that final day was 
that that morning was probably the coldest everything had frost on it i mean there was you'd run your hand across the steering wheel of the boat and you'd have a snowball on your hand so i mean it was it was uh not expected for a april tournament but that's you know like like we kind of mentioned prior to the tournament that had had to have had a pretty big uh role in the, the lower weight that's for sure People always said, why do you drive to all the events when I was a freelancer and I would run and do bass track and photo galleries on the water is because I learned my lesson my first year, 2014, I flew to Table Rock Lake for the April Elite Series event, projected 60 degree weather all week, you know, minimal winds, something happened and I just didn't check weather or it switched quickly, but I was in shorts and I had one pair of pants. And it was 40 degrees or colder the rest of the week. We know, obviously, a jerkbait factor, and it was definitely winter to pre-spawn feeling. So uh, one thing I'll key on before we get our first guest in here, Buddy Gross, the local of them all, made, made the cut on day one. He was in the cut. He was in there, 28th place, sitting well, and misses the cut, finishes in the 60s, I believe. What a crazy thing for locals this year. Um, you know, the only one who's really survived and not – not done terribly on his home body of water would be Patrick Walters, who had a, I think a mid twenties finish at Santee Cooper lakes. We probably had four guys that I would consider locals now at Chickamauga. And that would be Carl Jockamson, Jacob Fouts, Hunter Shryock and Buddy Gross. And uh, with Carl and Jacob making the final day and Hunter Shryock making the cut, it is weird to think like, let's just say, let's just say we had to say, would you take Buddy Gross to make the cut or the other three? Nine times out of 10, everyone's going to say, that's a guarantee Buddy Gross is going to make the cut. And the other three, maybe one or two do. No way all three do without Buddy making it. And uh, that was just the case. And so I don't know if their styles play into it, but I know Jacob being a, a river fisherman, being a, you know, up a creek, shallow water guy, it did play into his um, style better. It, it kind of played into the three guy. It, the only style it didn't play into obviously was Buddy Gross because Buddy Gross loves fishing offshore. He wanted winter pool. He wanted pre-spawn conditions. They didn't get back to his, they got to pre-spawn conditions, but it was after he was already out of the event. You know, it was already, it would have probably transitioned well if it was day one on Saturday, but for Buddy Gross to miss the cut doing his style of fishing. But then we saw Hunter Shroud catch some off the bed, caught some flipping, we see a spinner bait and a jackhammer come into play for Jacob Fouts. That's his gig. Then we saw big swim baits come in for Carl Jockamson. It, it was all over the map this week for techniques wise. And I, and I hope we get to have Jacob pop in in just a minute. And that's our first guest today. If you're just joining in, Jacob Fouts, Bassmaster Elite Series rookie, college uh, champ and bracket champion. He's been to the classic before, qualified through the opens um, in 2021, the Southerns too. That is a, a stud group of people it's hard to qualify no matter where you are but the southerns definitely get the most attention and bring in a grouping of of the best anglers in the world by far and so for jacob to do that in the opens last year like you said he kind of seems like he's not a kid anymore and he's definitely got a mature stud you know in the making in terms of uh techniques which is crazy because um about the time i guess you were still covering the college series is when i fished the college series um, and he's two years, one year, two years younger than me. And I, uh, received my fair share of butt whoopings from uh, him in college as well. What's going on? We got Jacob Fouts with us today and Kyle, you mentioned it. He, uh, he'll put some butt whoopings on anybody in college or the elites or the opens. And it looks like he's, I'm just going to guess he might be out on the lake right now because he lives on the lake every single day. Jacob Fouts, third place finish at Lake Chickamauga. Congrats on taking home the top local award. Doesn't pay anything other than what you earned for third place, but it's got to feel good. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was, it was just one of those deals where it seemed like it was getting better, better every day. And, uh, and I, fortunately that, that third day, I, I, I got kind of lucky and I caught a, caught an eight pounder, you know, so that, that, that always helps, helps jump the weight up there in a, in a, in a big way is catching one almost eight. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, I guess that was the biggest thing. I got, I got lucky and caught, caught one decent one, one decent one the first day and, and you know, help, help my weight out, help my weight out a bunch, but. You know, that, just that, that third day, I got lucky and caught an eighth pounder, and that's what kind of kind of vaulted me up there over 20. You know, I, I still have four other pretty good ones to go with it, but uh, by, 
but it, it was definitely not the not the same as the first two days. I, it, it, for me, it was time every single day. I, I wasn't getting just a, just a ton of bites. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I, I've spent, spent a bunch of time up there. And, uh, you know, I just I, I, I kind of got dialed into where they were there the last day of practice. And, you know, having history, I just kind of ran, ran as much stuff as I could as I could every single day and it worked out, worked out good. Sorry if I'm in the wind, I'm trying to get over here where I got good, good service. No, you're all good. That was a great answer. Kyle, what you got for, for Jacob while we have him. So Jacob kind of explain what that, that the morning was like on the final day of the event, obviously fishing your first top 10 as an elite series angler, uh, you know, you and Jason Christie basically battling it out up the Hiawassee River. Just kind of explain what that feeling was like and kind of where your mind was at first thing in the morning. You know, it, it was kind of surreal for me. I was, you know, it, I never expected to jump up up that high in the standings and have a have a legitimate shot at, at winning the tournament going into the final day. Yeah, it, it just said, I mean, the biggest, but the only way to explain it is surreal. I never – you know, you growing up, you don't, you don't, you don't ever think you'll be in that position to have a, have a shot at winning an elite series tournament. You know, it's, I've always, this is something I've always wanted to, wanted to do growing up, and uh, having a shot in my fourth tournament on my home lake. What, what more could you ask for? Yeah, well, we we talked about it, and Kyle, I wanted to jump in about this one. There was basically four locals in this event, and that was you, Carl Jacobson, Hunter Schrock, and Buddy Gross. For the three transplant locals, the guys from up north and not even from this country to move to Chickamauga and to, to know enough about the lake to be a local, to have enough time on the water, but then enough newness to it to probably take a different approach. The fact that Buddy Gross missed the cut, but you guys all did doing three different things, was it not knowing exactly what Buddy knows to make that mistake, or is it just your style of fishing being a shallow water guy probably? You know, it's just, this is just a weird time, weird time of year. You know, there's fish. It's just, fishing history on this lake tends to, tends to come back and bite you more times than, than not. So I, going into the tournament, I didn't want to, to get too caught up in how I've caught them in the past or anything like that. I just kind of tried to, uh, tried to fish the moment and, and, and what the fish were going on. You know, I, I had a, I had a pretty good idea of what might be going on. So that, that definitely helped, uh help the case but you know having as much history out here as buddy does i can i can definitely see where that where that hurt him you know I, outside of buddy i've probably spent probably spent more time out here than, than the other than the other two and carl and hunter but uh you know it you try not to you try not to get too caught up in how you caught him in the past you, you, you see it year after year with guys on their home lake how it how it tends to, to come back and bite him a little bit. So, you know, thankfully for me, it didn't, it didn't, it worked out the way it was supposed to. And I just, I just tried to fish, fish how I fish, fish shallow, you know, do my thing. You know, I'm, I'm surprised, surprised how it worked out. You know, like, like I was saying, it's hard to get, hard to get four days up the Hiawassee River. It's just, it doesn't have the population of fish that the, that the lake does. And it, with, with the water level, like it was, the fish didn't really seem like they were coming. You know, we were just catching the fish that were already up, and uh, thankfully, it, you know, it, it worked out the way it was supposed to. Now, Jacob, you kind of mentioned that about the Hiawassee River, and you you brought it up on stage on the final day that that is just your stomping grounds, and that is your area of the lake that you prefer. Uh, when it seemed like before the the tournament started, it's not like a lot of people really expected that to be one of the the major major players. Kind of talk about your decision to to stay in there all four days. And, you know, like I, I said to Ronnie, you know, just earlier watching you fish on the final day, it was very evident that you were hitting really certain spots and, you know, you weren't spending too much time. Just talk about that in general, how you've grown up fishing or not grown up, but obviously fish that area a lot. And then your decision-making to end up in that area in the tournament. Yeah. You know, I live, I've got a ramp right 10 minutes from, from the house up the, up the Hiawassee River and uh you know I've spent I've probably spent more time up that river than I have out here on the lake so you know it you know and I I had no intentions like I said I had no intentions on fishing up there but uh you know because I didn't I didn't figure you could get you could get four days 
four days out of it. So I, I, I spent I spent the first two and a half days of practice out here. Kyle, that darn bridge right. keeps cutting off his his service there. <laughs> but if if that bridge that bridge just keeps doing it, but uh, yeah, Jacob making it work in the Hawassi River. Um, that's a place, Kyle, that we saw in 2020 in the fall play out. But I think some guys probably got burned by it going into day three or day four of that event. And they're like, I'm not going to get burned by it this year. And they didn't try it. And I think that's why a lot of those other areas on Chick above the takeoff and then down, down below really got packed. And is that if you can hear us, Jacob, is that one incentive of fishing the Hawassi River? Yes, the population is not there. Maybe, yes, it's hard to make it four days. But, man, your competition is going to be few and far between compared to some of the mainstay areas on the actual Chickamauga itself, which you would classify as Chickamauga. Yeah. Can, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, that, that, was, that was definitely a big factor. I figured, I figured there wouldn't be, wouldn't be a whole lot of guys up there fishing, you know, and there, there wasn't very many. There was probably six or seven guys up there in total. And, you know, a lot of them weren't staying around all day. It was just kind of a run up there, hit a place and leave. And, uh, but you know, it, the, the lake anymore, it's just not, it's not what it used to be, you know, four or five years ago. The, the pressure seems to have, seems to have taken, taken a toll down here. And when you get a major tournament after everyone's taken a, taken a hot lap around the lake down here, it, it tends to, tends to toughen up. And that, that river up there, it, uh, it gets overlooked all the time and it's, it's got big ones up here. Maybe they don't grow near as big as they do out on the lake, but it's still got, it's still got plenty of big ones, plenty to, plenty to win a tournament, obviously. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a uh, it's the best kept secret on Chickamauga. I don't know about it anymore, but, uh, it, uh, it's a, it's a special place. It's a, it's a shallow water fisherman's dream. That's for sure. And I, you know, like I said, I only live 10 minutes from 10 minutes from the ramp up there. Well, Jacob, I appreciate you jumping in and joining in with us, giving us a little bit of insight about the Hawassi River. For a guy from Ohio to come to college down here at Bryan College on the banks of Chickamauga and to stay, to decide to, to put his roots down in the south on this lake, obviously speaks volumes to it. Definitely the pressure, because it is, Kyle, it is one of the smaller lakes on the Tennessee River. It's like, the, I think I think the, uh, the stat that Such said, it's like the sixth out of the nine it's like the sixth biggest. So not a huge place for as much pressure it gets. Uh, Jacob, last thing, now that you're cleared up a little bit, one last question. Uh, going for rookie of the year, that's something that you can only win once. That's what the cliche everyone says. You just jumped into the top three for rookie of the year. You're about 100 points behind. What is your outlook going the rest of the season as we have Fork, Pickwick, St. Lawrence, and then Owahi and Mississippi River up north? I'm not going to focus on it too much. I'm just I'm not going to I'd love to win to win rookie of the year, but I'm going to go to fish and try to win. That is something that a lot of people put pressure on themselves. And, Jacob, appreciate you joining us today. Um, we'll let you go, and we will get back with you uh, another day for sure, especially if you have some good finishes in the future. Kyle, Jacob Fouts, uh, a good interview. I'm super – hey, the first time I met him, he was probably the quietest kid that I'd ever talked to, especially like I wanted to talk to him because he was catching them. He's a great angler, but he was super quiet. Now to see him – kind of blossom over through the opens to get to the elites and, and whatnot. It, a uh, very promising young angler for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And you definitely love to see the stories like Jacob that have, have, you know, traveled the ranks up through high school and college and through the opens um, definitely makes you, you know, understand and, and, and younger kids obviously understand that, that this is a possibility you can do this and you know he's living proof of that you know seeing him have some early success excuse me on the uh, lead series is you know even more living proof of that i just want to say people want to talk about bassmaster lives coverage and their service he is up the hawassi and we had him and christy as clear as it comes on that final day 
and we can't even get a great, you know, two answers at him. We kept pushing it. We were texting back and forth, and it's like asking one more question. But if it clears up, we'll keep going. And then it wouldn't. And so, uh, obviously, he's a fisherman. He's a guide. He is always on the water. And I think that that uh, speaks volumes to an angler's success early in their career. Sometimes you get spread too thin trying to figure out what you should do on the Elite Series. Uh, but for Jacob, I feel very confident in him getting his footing moving forward because he's always on the water and he's always learning and always fishing. And I think that that, that is huge. If I could give any rookie piece of advice from watching the Elite Series and working with him almost for a decade, if you're a rookie, you got to try to make it work with no job. You got to put it you got to put in the hours on the water every day, no matter what body of water it is, not pre-practicing lakes, but just fishing. And you will just start to learn a lot more. And those bad tournaments go away a lot quicker because you're on the water the next week, uh, fishing somewhere else, just getting better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing that you can't replace. If you're somebody that's, that's Jacob's age and, you know, in the, in their twenties, you can't replace the amount of time or make up, let's say, the amount of time that the veterans on the elite series have have had, you know, so the only thing you can do is continue to stay on the water. Like you said, stay crisp um, and fish as much as you can. And obviously it's good to see guys like Jacob and, you know, obviously a lot of our rookies do that because that's ultimately what's going to help you, you know, the further down the road, the more experience you have, the more time on the water you have. Um, and you look at somebody like Jacob, the amount of tournaments Jacob Bouts has fished, in you know such a small amount of time i mean like we were talking about earlier i mean when i was fishing in college that was towards the you know the early start of jacob's age and he was at every tournament i ever fished and way more and you know has fished so many tournaments so you know especially like you said for young anglers that's a, a great example of you know the best way to you know stay sharp and get better is just spending time in the water and you hear that from anybody and everybody that you know is around this sport yeah, Jacob, if you do not know Jacob Fouts before this past event when he got third place at the Bassmaster Elite Series event, Fouts went to Bryan College as a freshman, I believe, and won the college national championship before 2017. I think every champion, bracket champion, was a junior or senior. It was guys who were finishing their career, definitely more seasoned than others. And he did, um, obviously, uh, he did it really early. He won the championship. And what was different was prior years, second, third, or fourth place, one of those teams ended up having the bracket champion come from that team. The champion never went back to back and won the bracket the next week on a different body of water or then a couple months later. It was always someone different for him and Jake Lee. They won the tournament at Bemidji, or yeah, up at uh, Bemidji on the Mississippi river where it starts way up there. And then he, uh, they went to uh, serpent Lake. I think I'm trying to remember this from years ago. They went to serpent Lake and did the bracket there. And I got to cover them both times they won. And then they both were in the finals for their bracket matchup for that spot in the classic Fouts fished the 2018 classic at Lake Hartwell, and then represented obviously the college series throughout all of the opens after that had an okay opens, record his rookie year or you know his first year out of college uh, or not out of college he was doing college and that but 41st 22nd uh, 101st 91st 57th 17th 78th 48th um, and that was the end of his season there so a lot of solid finishes just outside the cut and some of those for a check but then this past uh, season he did 2020 he did the three southern or the three eastern opens and then in 2021, he went full bore and did all of the uh, the Southern Opens. And uh, I believe he even tried to maybe do some of the Centrals as well. Qualified through the Southern Opens, second place in the points, and then jumped out and has done the Elite Series this year qualifying. So a little bit of background on Jacob Fouts. And we'll get to talk to him probably with better service at another point coming up soon. Hopefully, pardon uh, that for those who are wondering about the interview and if this is the production quality we're at. We're trying to get these guys wherever they are, and he just happens to be on the water, Kyle. Yeah, I know. Definitely not the most ideal circumstances for him to be on that lake. Um, it's all good. You know, like I, said, I asked him I, today, so it's fine. I asked him same day, so that's totally fine. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely not his fault whatsoever. But no. I can tell you from experience of being on the lake for the last you know, handful of days, the service is definitely spotty out there in areas. So uh, not super surprising to see some some tough service. But but yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, definitely staying sharp and, you know, fishing a lot. I mean, that's what it takes. And that's what he's doing. Can't well, play. speaking of fishing a lot, we have a lot of Elite Series pros and Bassmaster Opens pros segueing to another event this week, just a few days after Chickamauga. Some guys went from Tennessee straight to Virginia. Tell us about it a little bit. You're obviously not going to travel for that event. You're getting a, a, a little bit of a break before Easter, which is great. But we do have a Bassmaster Northern Open this week at the James River. Yeah, no, starting on Thursday, which will be tomorrow, I suppose the day the the podcast will likely come out yep. um, on yep. the on the James River. And, um, you know, it's interesting to see, you know, compared to last year where the entire northern season was for the most part later in the year. So it's it's good to get a northern open started a little bit earlier in the year. And, you know, obviously the James River is a place that we've had, you know, a handful of opens in the past and um, definitely looking forward to that one. I was just telling Ronnie a moment ago that I don't know a whole lot about the James River, but luckily Ronnie has covered a handful of events on the river. And uh, one of these days I'm, I'm hoping that I get to see it because I uh, definitely love the way it sets up and the way that, you know, guys typically catch them there. It's a lot of fun to watch and see. It is really cool. And it has, it has a special place in bass fishing and Bassmaster history overall, a special place in its heart. Cause that's where we had classics back in the day. We had a bunch of tidal river, classics like we had the chesapeake bay we had james river a few times i think hank parker won one of those we had the the infamous jim bitter moment happen on the james river where he measured the fish squirted out of his hand he loses by an ounce uh things like that um but yes i love the james river covered opens and the college series there multiple times the james river is very interesting because a lot of guys we have to go a long ways to catch their fish. A lot of guys will head down to the Chickahominy River, which if you look at the James River, the takeoff is not far from downtown Richmond, to be honest. You got to go down the river just a little bit past the bridges. You'll get to the takeoff area, and you have to flow south uh, and east out towards the ocean. But before you get to the ocean, you hook a left at the Chickahominy, and you can run all the way to the back of that, and that is where you know Brandon Pollock has done well. His resume here speaks for itself. What an impressive resume at the James River. Finally got his win there last year in May, and it had great weight for, for uh, the month of May. Super excited when the schedule came out that it was in April for the James River. Interested to see how that plays out. We've never really had a pre-spawn Tidal River event. The one Tidal River event we've had recently would be Winya Bay for the Elite Series, and there was that was one on Sight Fish with Stetson Blaylock and really, you know, fish that were heading towards sight fishing. And uh, then we had the guys out on the flats up in the Cooper River. So a little bit of different flair this week, and we're going to have a guest pop in in just a few minutes um, to kind of give us a preview of that. He's one of our Elite Series pros that is fishing that. But the Northern Opens this year, it very cool because it's different. It's not always just – my opinion is this. We, we have the Southern Opens which is, you know, normally Florida, Tennessee, and another state mixed in. Then we have the Centrals, which is Louisiana, Oklahoma. Sometimes it's been the Mississippi River, and it'll be maybe Alabama mixed in. The Northern Opens, it's been heavy New York and heavy smallmouth. This year, we've got two Tidal River, dirtier water, and, and I'm very interested to see how that plays into our qualifiers. Northern Opens always produces great qualifiers, but I'm interested to see if it's the same notorious guys that qualify. Um, or if it's going to be some, maybe some grinders, some dirty water guys. So I'm going to go ahead and have our guest pop in. Our guest is Mr. Greg De Palma, Northern Hammer, um, hanging out with us, getting some assistance. What's Greg, going on, can you, Ronnie? Can you hear us, Greg? I can. Can you hear me? I can, man. Uh, I'm super excited to talk to you today. Thanks for taking the time to hop on the podcast with us. We've got the James River coming up, man. And that is coming up uh, as the podcast posts. It's day one of the event. And this is a place that you've done very well at. It's a place that I always see you at when I cover the events. And uh, I know it holds a special place in your heart. And it's going to be a little different because we've never had one in April. What should we expect this week? Well, I think there's a, I know there's a ton going on, a lot of different things. I don't really truly think these fish have spawned yet. So that's good. Um, I think it's going to be a mixture of pretty much whatever you want, want to do. You can still catch them in creeks. You can still catch a main river. 
Uh, there is fish that are pulling up. That's what I'm doing. I'm totally, totally going to focus on the spawn, 100%, because I feel like if this place pops, that's how you win. So try to, you know, without giving away too much information for somebody like me that's never been there, um, some of the types of areas that, you know, you would be looking for, um, like, you know, you mentioned main river stuff. You're obviously looking further backs in the creeks, I imagine, for, you know, the kind of the areas you're going to be fishing. Now, this, so this river is a little bit different. Um, the way it kind of works here, uh, if you were to be going for spawning fish, uh, whether it's main river, uh, obviously the Chickahominy is always a big player here. Um, a lot of these fish, uh, basically, you got a main channel that runs through, whether it's Main River or the Chickahominy, any of them bay slash coves that are semi-protected, uh, generally on this place, I mean, it's, it's all about the cypress this time of year. But there is uh, pads coming up in a lot of areas, then fish will use that. Uh, arrowheads are a big deal here, but they're not really up yet, so I don't think the fish are going to use them. So I think, I think the dominant pattern is going to be hardcover, for sure. That's the one thing that, that I always find interesting when I go there, whether it's Chip Oaks, whether it's the Chickahominy, whether it's the Appomattox, there's so many different places that you can go at the James River. And there's always, there's a, it's a great fishing area. And it's funny to see how many tournaments go out of maybe where we do up closer to Richmond and how many fish get caught. And maybe we always talk about, you know, displacing fish to a different part of the lake through tournament fishing. A lot of fish get taken up towards that area at takeoff. But yet the Chickahominy will always have five, six, seven anglers in the top 10 because the population of fish is so good there. Can you explain that a little bit? Is there just so many untapped bass that aren't caught in the tournament that there's always going to be a solid population? Or do you think they just swim 50 miles back to the Chickahominy as quick as they can, as if they know, you know, right where they're from, which, which tree they came from? I do. Uh, I do believe a lot of these fish do swim back, but I can tell you from my experience from the beginning till coming here now, the main river has really started to play the last three to four years more than it ever has. I'm going to go out in a wing, uh, wing here and I'm going to say, I think this might be the first one where it's truly one on the main river. Uh, the reason I say that, and I'm, I'm going to fish main river, but I'm not starting main river. The reason I say that is because it's been a kind of a weird year weather-wise. I think the fish wanted to get up. They didn't want to get up, you know, the whole thing with the weather. I believe the fish on the main river James do not have to travel as far. I think they can come out of that channel. There's so much cypress on the banks. I think they can spawn a lot more. And I think a lot of these guys, I think by now the word's out. A lot of the guys are pretty much running main river stuff and they're catching a lot of these really big fish. And I, I want to say because of all them tournaments over the years now out of the Osborne, it's really thriving on the river, and a lot of them big fish are still staying in the river. So for them fish to make that transition isn't very far. Not that the Chickahominy is really far, but there's a lot less areas on the Chick that are as protected because of that. Not only just the wind and stuff and weather, but also from the currents. Now, give us, give us an ideal, you know, obviously being a little bit different time of the year, kind of give us your projection for winning weight, and then obviously to make – the day three cut, what you think it'll take after two days? Man, really warm weather, full moon on Sunday. If this place lines up how I hope it's going to, I think it could be potentially the highest weights we've ever had for this tournament. But if it doesn't, there's a ton of males from one to two pounds on the back. I mean, they are everywhere. It's no matter where you go. Um, it's a hard one because – I really haven't caught, honestly, that many big fish this week. I've only practiced two and a half days, but I know I'm in the right areas. You know, so if it doesn't happen on this moon, on this cycle, I'm going to say the weights are going to be just average. Not 16, 17 is going to be really good, I think, uh, for winning weight. But and it's, it's too hard to say. In two and a half days, I can only cover so much water. I mean, I pulled out so many different times and went looked at the pits, trying to find spawning fish at low tide so I can see them. That's another thing, too. The water's dirty right now. It's cleaning. Uh, they must have had a lot of rain up in, you know, in the west and in the mountains and it really muddied a lot of the river up. Um, but it's getting to be really good. It's getting that green tint back to it. I think it's lining up properly. But, you know, this year, this year, on cold weather and then beautiful weather the day before and the tournament. And you guys all saw what's been happening. I mean, it's been lining up perfect. Will this James River event do it? I don't know, but statistically it should. 
you know. Hey, hey Greg, I've I've been there. I know the kind of the title swings, and I know what the moon can do to swings and making it a little bit more. Are we looking at a normal tide fluctuation this week for the James with the full moon? And then a second part of that question is. Can you explain dirty water? Because a I've never seen a tidal body of water that is clean water, according to most anglers across the country. They're going to be like, Greg, clean water. This guy, he doesn't belong on the Elite Series. I mean, they're going to probably say that in, in messages on Facebook anyways, because that's Facebook. But um, clean water, what are you talking about? But the difference in dirty, nasty water versus good tidal water it's it's a fine line for some people, but for you guys, it's definitely obvious. So a little bit on the tide fluctuation this week. What what are the lows and high swings? And then obviously the importance of that water clarity. Yes. Yeah, so the tide swings so far have been pretty good. Once you get close to that full moon, uh, you can have really dramatic tides as far as blowouts uh, or, or suckouts and as far as really high tides. Um, I think we're going to see that. Uh, we saw a big time actually last year and we didn't have a full moon last year. One thing that's going to happen tomorrow is going to be super windy. Tomorrow is going to be a southwest wind gust of 25. So yeah. we already kind yeah. of had that, I think, two days ago. Um, and it really actually didn't mess with it too much. East and west winds on this river really suck it in and pull it out. Um, I think it's going to be okay. I really do. I don't think it's going to be really super dramatic as far as the tides go in this one. I think it's going to play out pretty good because everything's been pretty normal. And sometimes I've noticed where on moons uh, prior to even getting to the full moon, you'll start to have a lot of the fluctuations really hard and really soft. And, you know, it seems pretty normal. Um, now, dirty water. So when you have a ton of rain that comes down these rivers, uh, you know, a lot of rivers are still dictated by, uh, for example, where I live on the upper bay, we have the kind of wing of dam up top. Uh, and that can just dump gallons of water. When we have all that water coming down. It churns everything up. So more or less what I'm trying to say is the river hasn't been settled. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, if you're out in the river and you get a really windy day where it's beating the bank, it churns everything up. All that water coming down kind of did the same deal, but I'm starting to see the water get that greenish tint to it. When I say clean, I'm not saying you can see your bait down three feet. Clean here is like a good foot. I mean, you can see a foot. That's, that's good clarity on the river system most of the time. So that's what I'm trying to say. The settlement's finally settling is what's happening. And that, and I'll, Kyle, I'll jump in on that real quick before, before we segue off of that, because I wanted to key in on that is, when you come to a tidal body of water like the James River, like the maybe the Potomac, Chesapeake, things like that, you guys will experience the Chesapeake for another open this year in the Northern Open. So that'll be a fun one to, to pay attention to as well. But uh, when it is dirty and churning or and not settled out, like you said, it is a siltier, muckier type bottom compared to like when you said the wind was blowing and it'll churn it up. When you see like the wind form a mud line on Chickamauga or somewhere else that's clay, it is just messing with the coloration of it. It's not silt in the face of the bass and they, they can't stand that. That's why when you guys go to Florida, you talk about Tokyo rigs and drop shots, things that keep it off the bottom because they don't want that silt in their face. So for shallow, bass that live shallow at the james river most times of the year how are they affected by that churning do they do they not push as shallow and they stay a little bit more maybe the secondary stumps do they ride where that water is good during high and low tide or do they deal with it and just are tougher to bite well if it's very consistent weather which we've kind of had like cold weather now we're having a real big warming trend if it's very consistent uh Let's just say early spring, you know, let's say winter to spring, uh, there will be a rush in the banks sometimes. When you get into the warmer temps, like in the summer times, when it gets like that, that's when they're always on the bank. They're tight to the cover. This time of year, uh, I'm going to say tide doesn't matter as much. Uh, and this time of year, when that water gets like that, that's when it matters the most, when it's all messed up. These fish, the first big wave of fish, I really feel like this early on, they need the conditions to be almost perfect. And that's when they're going to flood the bank. You know, they need the moon, they need the weather, they need the water clarity to be good, to get the penetration for the eggs, all that stuff. If they're going to get up there, it's got to be right. But once they lock on, it's game on. You know, that's the other side of it too. Um, so there's just so many variables, Ronnie. It's hard to explain it all, you know. For sure. Kyle, you got anything yeah. for Greg about the James River coming up? So I, I guess my last question, and this, this is probably going to be a hard one to answer, but I'm just asking because I'm curious for myself. So, you know, obviously the Chickamauga event, there was a lot of talk prior to the event about the fish spawning, not spawning, waiting till the water comes up. 
obviously water level having so much, you know, being so much of a factor for that event. And then you talk about a tidal river, you know, system, some somewhere I don't have, you know, just a type of body of water I don't have much experience on. Kind of explain the differences between the spawn. So obviously a lake that has normal uh, water levels that don't fluctuate, it's pretty self-explanatory. But for somebody that's never fished a tidal river, kind of just explain the the spawning situation do they spawn further out off the banks or you know kind of how how do they set up comparatively to you know just a highland reservoir maybe yeah so one thing in particular about river systems is generally your fish on a river system are more hardy uh, which means they usually will spawn first before a lake takes off a lot of times i mean i grew up on a river system i've seen this a million times we have a ton of lakes and our our river fish always spawn first now, as far as the setup goes, uh, on a normal situation, generally a fish will pretty much make its bed at that low water line. So if you've got a, a low tide, uh, I've seen so many fish so many times on a tidal water, once they set up and make that bed, if you get a really low, low tide, they'll almost be laying on their side on the bed, just waiting for the tide to come back in. So uh, I, I really, this, this week in practice, if for example, let's say one of the pits was low tide at eight o'clock in the morning, I made sure that eight o'clock in the morning, I was in them pits, you know, like a half hour before looking on trolling motor because the water clarity is not the best. So I want to make sure that I can see all them fish if they're there. You know, if you went in there high tide, there's no way you can see them. You have to drag blind and try to catch them. Hey, let's just face it, Greg. We've been a, we've been a tidal river bass on an extremely low tide, just waiting on the bed for our woman to show up, just laying there sideways. I mean, we've all been there probably. So we're all married here in this group. No, I kid, obviously. But hey, repeat for me your winning weight and your cut weight. I we we you cut out just for a minute, but we heard you think maybe 16 to 17 pounds a day to maybe get the win or to, to be in contention for that. Um, but did you say anything dramatically less to make that day three cut? I think 16, 17 on a tough. We got somebody else popping in here. Kobe Krieger. What's up, Kobe Krieger? He'll be one to watch this oh, week. He knows he knows this place as well. He actually walked in at the end of it. Um, so I think I think if it's I think if if the fish don't flood the bank, I still want to say 16, 17 a day in the low end. And if it gets really good, you're gonna need some weight for sure. Um, you're gonna need if it gets really good. I mean, I'm not a true, you know, I don't live here, but I can tell you that this place has got them. You know, it could take that 22 to 23 a day and have the best weights you've ever had for this place. Um, but one thing I do know about this place, you catch 15 a day, you're always doing well, no matter what. So if I catch 15 tomorrow, I'll still be happy even if it's a blowout or not even a good one. You know, 15 a day is always good. So 17, 18, 22, 23, or the two expectants I got. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Uh, last thing before we let you go, I know that shipwrecks and barge deals and, and some of that gnarly non-natural structure sometimes plays, especially in the heat of the summer where, where fish might school up this time of the year when there may be more loners and they're kind of cruising up to the bank on their own one at a time and they're not just on a spot by them or with a, with a group of fish. Will we see any of that stuff come into play? Uh, in the backs of the creeks where some of those things happen or, you know, the main river, the junk that's happened over the, over the past couple of years? 100%. The barge pits are going to play without a doubt. Um, a lot of the fish spawn in there. Fish do live in there. A lot of fish winter in there for sure. Uh, they're going to play. Creeks will play. Uh, a lot of these creeks uh, are natural feeder creeks, which means they're very sandy in the back. Uh, is all they got to do is just pop off on one of the pockets in the side of one of them creeks easily could spawn. I looked in a lot of areas this week, just like that for them individual fish. Um, and obviously, yes, the main river for sure will play. There's, you can, I think in this derby, I think you can literally do whatever you want. I think you can fish it like a river and close your eyes. I think you could spawn fish it and just, you know, go just for spawning areas. And I think you can fish off the bank and still catch them in that six to 10 foot range. Just because there's so many fish that are doing different things right now, I think it's going to be a wide open event as far as fishing techniques go. I think there's going to also be, I'm just going to go on a limb here because I heard a little bit. I think there's going to be a pattern, if it holds true, that could kind of blend a little bit with what Brandon Polnick did last year. I'm not saying area wise, I'm saying bait wise. So kind of keep your eyes out for something maybe a little bit different this year. It'll be pretty neat if it happens. 
That definitely will be something interesting. I always love those tidal river places, the St. John's, the James Rivers of the world, where you see the old school creature baits and ribbon tail worms come back out. It is definitely a time warp in bass fishing. And uh, hey, Greg, good luck this week. Keep your jack plate up high. Do not have to get out <laughs> and don't get muddy. I know how that place is. Uh, sometimes when you run in an area, you better just run until you hit because you're not, you're going to have to idle a long way. So uh, Greg, you're one of the one of the guys I met at the James, and uh, obviously the James helped you get to the Elite Series. Coming off a great finish at Chickamauga, uh, is that I think it, I think your best of the year. You had a top twenty there at Chickamauga, so uh, carrying yeah. some momentum into this event. We talked at the Classic on Bass UTV. You're getting in that point now. It's coming to your territory of the country, uh, coming up north and some momentum down south. So you may make an appearance on the fantasy teams. Don't you worry. Me and Kyle will talk about it. We'll put our heads together. But it could be coming very soon for you. So, Greg, appreciate you. Tell Kobe we said hey and good luck. We will uh, we will see how the Open plays out this week. But that was Greg DePalma, Bassmaster Elite Series Pro, fishing the Northern Open this week at the James River. Yep. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Kyle, I'm very excited to see how it is. I've always covered events there. I don't have to cover this one necessarily, and we get to watch it play out. But I know I've never fished a tidal body of water other than the St. John's, where it's very, very limited. You don't really run tides of the St. John's. People can say they have. If you get above Palatka towards Jacksonville, you can kind of run tides there a little bit because it's so much closer to the ocean. But for the James River, I've been there so many times and I've been to Winya, I've been to the Chesapeake, been to the Potomac. I feel like I can run tides and know what fish do on those tides. Uh, so it'll be very interesting. I know that every time I watched an event, I learned a lot. So I, I know that they're new to you, um, but it'll be, it's always cool to watch those old school events. Yeah, no, so I, I'm the same way. So I obviously have very little to no experience fishing tidal rivers so or tidal systems so naturally it's it's intriguing to talk to somebody like greg that has a lot of knowledge uh because you know as a fisherman i always think of like the certain events or types of events that i would just be completely lost and clueless and that's those events are sometimes the ones that i feel like i would literally have no earthly idea what's going on because um you know it's so much more unique in a lot of ways than just you know your normal um, you know, I, you basically throw tidal systems, you know, completely outside of any yeah. other lake because they are so unique. Uh, I was going to name an example, but I mean, it's really different than pretty much anywhere that's not a tidal, tidal system. So um, definitely looking forward to, to seeing it again this year. Obviously, uh, you know, the weights, like you said, were good last year. So having his insight on the fact that the weights could be even better is really, really exciting from a, uh, from a, you know, a fan perspective for sure. Yeah, I think that the tide aspect for folks listening in that don't necessarily know about tide fishing, I, I don't want to act like an expert on this. So I'm just going to relay what I've been what I've learned and what I've been relayed over the past couple of years covering these events. You always want the tide moving. Some people don't like high tide. Some people some people catch them on high tide. Some people catch them on low tide. But you want it moving. You never want it dead low sitting there you, waiting for it to turn dead high waiting for it to turn some kind of falling movement to, towards low tide or a rising movement that little bit of water moving will have the fish moving obviously low tide if you know where low tide's going to be you now know how far you need to go back in places at certain times of the day obviously they have tide charts on their graphs that show them hey at 12 12 37 it's going to be dead low tide today and so some of those guys use that on, hey, I'm going to get into an area at nine o'clock and I need to be out of there by 1230 or I'm going to be stuck, things like that. Or I need to get to this stretch of cypress trees as it's getting closer to low tide because those fish will go from, you know, if you think about it, those fish will be up on the bank behind the cypress trees and you can, it might not be a long area, but it's 10 to 20 feet of strike zone they could be at. And you might throw a crankbait, a spinnerbait, a, spinner a chatterbait, things like that, or a topwater. But then as that low tide sucks them from the actual shoreline out to a tree, I mean, that is your high percentage place. So it can get very cool calling your shot. Um, and obviously the time of day, it changes by an hour each day. And that is, um, I watched some video the other day. And as a fisherman, I thought it was a bunch of BS because the guy was like, the tide doesn't come in and out. 
the earth is spinning and so the water is the same but the earth spins and that scientifically may get may be truth but it does go in and out every hour if you're a fisherman uh, if, if you don't believe so, just sit your trolling motor in the same spot and it'll be dry for part of the day and it'll be wet for part of the day. So, uh, tidal river places are very cool. And it'll be very interesting. The James river is definitely a place that has some dinosaurs, some, some eight to 10 pounders. Um, and we've seen some guys win there. Brandon Polonix won there. Charlie Hartley's won there. Uh, Rick Morris, he's an old school angler. He's from that region. Uh, the Pete Glusics of the world have led. Mike Iaconelli has led there. So you either have to know a lot about tidal fishing and run the tide, or you need to know nothing about tidal fishing and just go fishing in a good area all day long. Like that's the thing. You either run from area to area on the tide, or you find an area where you've gotten bites and you stay there all day and fish it on high and low tide. So that's my, maybe not two cents, but like seven cents worth uh, on that basically get in an area that you know there's fish and just wait till they start biting regardless what tide that is if it's a falling tide a rising tide whatever it is like you said uh basically just get in an area and just fish it really thoroughly which which reminds me um of john cruz talking about his saint john's win and uh fishing by west logan who had no idea what the tides were which he said i, I went back and watched that the other day because i was laughing at that um, you know, he was like, I, it's really crazy that he was able to catch him as good as he was because he had no idea where the tide was. At. Um, I actually showed Wes that and he got a kick out of that. He said, yep, I had no idea. So, well, and that's the fun thing. Little bit of that. <laughs> you either have to get away from it. You know, the tide is going to be a lot less impactful, even though it's much narrower up at the Osborne landing up at towards takeoff, you know, because it's so much farther from the ocean. Um, so it's going to be less of a swing there because by the time it gets you know, a hundred miles down the river out to the ocean, there's already water that's coming back in, you know, at a certain point. And so it sure. doesn't get to leave, you know, the water that leaves Osborne landing might not get to the main bridge at the Appomattox before it starts coming back in. So it's going to be a much quicker turnaround for those places compared to the mouth of Chickahominy, which, um, you know, is, is much closer to the outflow. So it'd be very interesting, but make sure you check it out. The St. Croix Bassmaster Northern Open, uh, pros and co-anglers fishing three days, hopefully the last open we had only went two days because of weather, but hopefully three days on the James river, like Greg De Palma said, a Southwest wind is in store for them on day one on Thursday and Southwest for some places that'll ship the tide out quicker and some creeks that'll keep it in, you know, and, and the way that the Chickahominy faces a Southwest wind may keep some water in that place. Um, where it may ship it out of the Appomattox or some other places. So we'll, we'll see and keep an eye on that. Um, but Kyle, appreciate you joining me for this episode. Um, well, actually, I forgot. Let's get into our uh, a quick fantasy recap at Chickamauga. I wanted to, to do that real quick. And so we'll get into who we picked, where we went wrong very quickly, and we'll talk about that. So for me, Kyle, I had a decent week. You know, I had a decent week. I had like a thousand and eighty eight points, you know, almost eleven hundred points um, had a decent showing overall moved up from the mid seventies to the mid eighties percentage wise. Um, now my points and my rank overall are very similar, which it has not been that way this year. It's been low points and high rank. And so now they're kind of equalizing out a little bit. But for Chickamauga, where I went right, I went right picking Matt Robertson and Ed Lochran. Uh, where I went wrong, I picked Micah Frazier. He got 85th. Um, and then I mixed in two mid-20s finishes with Brandon Lester and Bill Lowen. So two guys in the mid-20s. Ed Locker made a top 20. Matt Robertson made a top five. And then Micah Frazier got me a bottom 10, unfortunately. But, hey, it kind of goes that way, I guess. Yeah, so I, 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 was, I was similar to you, but – in fantasy fishing, uh, Rap Club Bassmaster fantasy fishing, that is, uh, I went down, I, I guess it'd been about one or two percent. Um, so it was the first tournament all year that I haven't had over a thousand points, which that kind of hurt my pride. Uh, I was I was enjoying having over a thousand points in every event up to this point, uh, you know, which obviously helps as far as being consistent goes. But um, but yeah, I had I had, you know, a 45th place finish with David Mullins. Uh, you know, just squeaked in the cut. So, I mean, he didn't really falter a whole lot. Uh, Chris Aldane 
in bucket B. Uh, he fell off pretty bad on the, the second day of the event. Uh, obviously, like we talked about earlier, you saw that with a lot of guys, so that wasn't super unusual. Uh, but still not a terrible finish at 55th. Uh, Wes Logan at 60th. Uh, Hunter Shryock 29th. And then Ed Lochran also at 17th, same as you. So, uh, but, but I'm sure we're going to get into this, but train the lake. I actually made a complete 180. Um, and if you listen to our preview of the Chickamauga event, I, I made it very clear. I had some heavy hitters going into this one, uh, because I had saved a lot of anglers previously. Um, and I jumped up from the, I want to say the mid eighties percent wise to 96.4%. So me and Ronnie are really, really close and draining the lake. Now I made a comeback we're doing it yeah and and we'll get into our drain the lake teams because you're sitting at 96.4 percent but i am still sitting at 96.5 percent so i've still got you by 0.1 but it's actually only seven spots my camera went a little fuzzy there for those watching on youtube uh it's only seven spots between me and you over our seven points sorry seven points between me and you so very very close tight battle there and you did go for it i mean you had the jason christie's and the greg hackney's of the world on your team and then um there we go now we're clear yeah you you went for it and i'm i've been growing every single event i've been getting better and i'm gonna pick a, a bone to pick at the harris chain and at chickamauga i had three anglers make the final day out of my eight picks three anglers made the final day both times I got second place, third place, and then one other position in the top 10. This week, it was second, third, and fifth. So I missed out on doubling my points for the winner because if you pick the winner and drain the lake, you get double points. So instead of 300, you get 600. I missed out on that two events this season by one spot, and I've had second, third, and fifth. And then at the Harris Chain, I had second, third, and eighth. So luckily for us, we both picked Jason Christie when he won an event. I got triple points at the Classic. You got double points at Chickamauga. And those were the points you needed to, to get within seven points of me so far. Yeah, Ronnie texted me after the tournament and said, how did you not use Jason Christie for the Classic? I told him, I knew he was going to win the Chickamauga. <laughs> yeah. so this was part of part of my comeback plan. Um, no, I, I didn't necessarily think that was going to be the case, but I was happy for the sake of my fantasy team that that did happen. I know Ronnie and I both. I wanted you had three day three guys fishing the final day as well in this event. Yep, I had Brock Mosley, Jacob Fouts, and Caleb Kufall. And I did not. And so I preface this on Bass Live. I pick my team. I've picked my teams in January. Like I already, I it's an experiment. Me, Tommy, and Suit are having a competition where we are. We picked our teams at the beginning of the year for each event before we ever made a cast to know uh, and know what the conditions are, to know, you know, if Santee is a three-day event, a four-day event, all that kind of stuff, um, to know that Lake Fork is seven feet low. We didn't know that when we picked it, you know, that it was going to stay seven feet low. And so I picked Caleb Kufal for Chickamauga well before he went on a run and did well at Santee Cooper Lakes, got second. So I didn't pick him because he was a hot hand, but I had already picked him. Um, and so, yeah, I had Brock in second, uh, Jacob Fouts in third, Caleb Kufal in fifth, and they really helped me out because Kyle Welcher, Buddy Gross, and Skylar Hamilton were my three guys that missed the cut. Uh, so I had a 61st, a 71st, and a 91st for the guys below the cut. Everyone else was in the top 32, including three making the final day. Yeah, and you and I had very similar Drain the Lake rosters. Um, I also had Kyle Welcher, Buddy Gross, um, but then I did have you know Jacob Fouts in third. Jason Christie won the event. Uh, Greg Hackney did not do nearly as well as I would have expected him to do in this event. I actually finished 75th, so I was a little bummed there. Uh, was definitely on the fence about having him at Santee Cooper, uh, but I was, I, you know, I wanted to save him, wanted to have that X factor later on in the uh, in the year, but it just didn't work out for me in this one. But I say it didn't work out for me. I won our internal uh, Bassmaster League, and like. Like we already mentioned, I'm only seven points behind you. So uh, it's a long I, game. I like, baby. I, I like I, my chances yeah. here the rest of the year. Let's just put it that way. We are slowly building and everyone in fantasy fishing, I gave you a big heads up for drain the lake, a uh, big leash. And now I am slowly bringing that thing in here. Uh, 
I'm now 672nd in the world. So we are climbing and climbing. I'm still not even better than Tommy Sanders and all of it. So driving me nuts with that, but uh, we get to pick and we get to pick and laugh at each other for that. But he had a bad event at Chickamauga. I will say that. So I'm, we caught, we caught him. We're catching him a couple hundred points every event. And we'll be there. I will say you started a new little thing for us in the last podcast preview in the event. When we pick our teams, you were like, let's pick one underrated or underdog guy who we think could win the event. And I got to tell you, you said, Ray Hanselman, baby. And did he just not, he didn't, he finished bottom 10 for you, man. And that was, and then my pick was Matt Robertson, undoubtedly underrated percentage wise. He's going to win the event. He got fifth. So I'm just but saying. There's, there's a difference <laughs> even between those two. So when you, you, Ronnie texted me that, I wanted to remind <laughs> me of that. The difference was Matt Robertson was still picked at like 4% in his bucket. Ray Hanselman was picked at 0.1%. So I, I'm gonna all I'm saying is he wasn't even close to a percent of a percent. So all I'm saying is there's a little difference in, in our dark horses. I guess you and I don't consider dark horses well, the same way. You did not outline it the parameters, you know, with percentages. We threw one out there that maybe every event will look at the guys two percent and less going forward. But because you put me on the spot, I picked uh, Robertson and I picked a second guy, and I, I don't remember who the second guy was. We'll have to go back and pull the receipts on that one, but uh, we'll see how bad our second guys did because we both picked the second guy. I think you picked Wes Logan. Um, possibly, and so I'll have to figure I out. I, I picked Strassner, who I oh, think had, yeah, he made the he cut. made the cut. He made yeah. the cut, but you know, not definitely not a. Uh, I don't think he was up there near the the winning mark, but um, but yeah, um, so yeah, let me let me go and look. Yeah, if you want to know, I did I did send him a text with the. Uh, I can't hold on. Let me get it there. Focus. I did send him the video receipts of our, of our picks. So we'll have to keep track of that going forward in the next one, but that's what we'll do. We will see you in the next episode of the podcast next week. It's going to be a special one. I think a little bit different tone. We'll have the open in the books. We'll have a college event coming up. We'll also, there is a kayak event this weekend at grand Lake. That's going to be going on. So you'll be able to check out bassmaster.com for all your kayak results and the open results. We still got a couple weeks. Uh, thankfully, I'll say that proudly. We have a couple of weeks till the next elite event. We got a little bit of a break. Um, I'm going to go change some diapers. I will, you go catch some bass. Uh, there's no chance I'm going to go sight fishing anytime soon. We had 37 feet of rain in Arkansas this week. So those beds are definitely on ledges now compared to where they're at. So uh, happy Easter to everybody on the podcast. We will see you in the next episode next week, but this was episode 71 of the inside Bassmaster podcast with Ronnie Moore. And my man, Kyle Jesse.